So we've just been listening to our academic consortium that was a panel discussion riveting indeed, algorithmic warfare, impact, influence and regulation. So if that is going over your head, don't despair. One of our panel members, he's a professor and an expert in war studies. Professor Franz Osinga has been kind enough to give us some of his time just to explain the nitty gritties of this panel discussion. Professor, a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. You said something quite impactful and quite dramatic. You said that uh, AI is not a revolution it is a new reality. Can you unpack that for us? What does it mean? Yes, well, I tried to make the argument that um, robotics right, are already prevalent in our society. AI has been introduced in our society uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, and therefore, it will also be introduced on the battlefield. We're already seeing that. And the, the coupling of AI with drones uh, has become rather easy. We see it right now in the war in Ukraine. Um, but also in other theaters, we see also non-state actors, uh, rebels, for instance, using drones already to attack hundreds of kilo targets hundreds of kilometers away. Well, and the argument I made was that uh, that development is already taking place and will just continue. And there are certain concerns, absolutely, it leads to the dehumanization of warfare, right? Uh, it is machines deciding by themselves whether or not to target somebody or an object. So there are definite ethical and legal concerns. On the other hand, there is this autonomous technical push because so, most of these developments are also driven by commercial concerns for commercial applications, civilian applications. But uh, these technologies are very easy to militarize. And my argument was that right, because we are seeing them already on the battlefield, right, we need to cope with that. Um, we also need to recognize that from a military perspective in various countries, people see utility uh, in introducing those systems on the battlefield itself while taking care of the concerns of uh, creating collateral damage and civilian casualties with those, uh, with those systems. But at the battlefield, when there's little risk of causing collateral damage and civilian casualties, these, can actu these systems can actually you have a tactical advantage for the soldier, but also at the higher levels, they can protect areas against incoming high-flying fly, high missiles, hypersonic missiles. So there are operational, tactical and strategic benefits of having these systems. And right now, indeed, we are at this moment where there's a strong ethical legal concern, whether we in the West we want to have these technologies. On the other hand, we see these technological developments taking place on the market, but also on the battlefield. It's, it's quite a, a conundrum, isn't it? And I'm uh, sorry to bring this up, uh, Professor, because this summit is happening after a big global story where the United States shot down a surveillance system of China that was flying over its territory controversial politically, but my sense was that people were relieved that uh, the, their government was ahead of the game. And it links to what the Minister of Foreign Affairs here at the Netherlands had said, that technology is developing so fast, states and governments don't have a choice but to lead and to catch up because these things are a reality. Um, there's that movement, right? There's the fear of missing out. Uh, you see, there's a certain security dilemma. If you see other great powers, for instance, developing these capabilities, or even smaller medium powers, because these technologies are available to all sorts of actors because they are developed in the civilian and commercial world. But there is this push also to invest in those capabilities yourself. Uh, so there's, there's, there's this proliferation dynamic ongoing because in, indeed in these days we are living in the era of great power competition. And in particular the, the major powers, Russia, China and the US, but also Europe, uh, are looking very carefully in what's happening at the other side, right, uh, in China and Russia. In Europe, however, you, also, you still see a, a, a large reluctance in the public and a political division between countries, whether or not this technology is actually uh, something that our governments should be investing in, because all these ethical and legal considerations have, and, and problems and dilemmas haven't actually been squared, squared out yet. Just on that and to conclude, that takes us then to why we are here today, why the summit is important. In your own words, why is it? This is one of those unique moments to bring all the stakeholders in these dynamics uh, together uh, and trying to 
make any progress in developing norms on how to regulate these technologies. Right? People talk about uh, meaningful human control. That has been a very forceful movement over the past couple of years. Now, how do you actually introduce meaningful human control into the design, the development, and in the end also the employment of these technologies? And I think this is a unique forum where you actually have all the players together to, uh, to actually create a very fruitful discussion. Professor, grateful for your time. Thanks indeed. Thank you. That was Professor Franz Osinger, who's a professor in war studies, and just sharing with us the moment, the political moment in which we find ourselves. AR is changing our lives as we know it, and not so much so only in the military, but every aspect of our lives. The question is, here at the Re-AIM Summit, how do stakeholders prepare? How do they have conversations? How do they broaden the application and the understanding of AI so that it is used for greater good? The debates continue right here at the Re-AIM Summit at The Hague in the Netherlands.